Amen. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, we'd ask to turn to Exodus, Exodus chapter 3. And while you're turning there, uh, <coughs> continue to remember each of our missionaries when you pray. I haven't heard from Brother Kraft recently. I did talk to him, I guess it was a week ago, and he understood that our meeting had to be canceled, and we talked about a couple of other things, but they are doing well. And uh, no COVID in that area as yet, so we give the Lord the praise for that. Exodus chapter 3, we're going to begin reading in the very first verse. Exodus 3, in the first verse, the Bible says, Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the backside of the desert, and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in the flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush was burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight while the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Draw not, not, draw not nigh hither. Put off thy shoes from off thy feet. For the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you uh, for your word this morning. We thank you how it brings comfort to our hearts. God, now we pray that you would honor your word with the presence of the Holy Ghost. Lord, that you would come in. Lord, and that you convict sin, uh, Lord, in our lives where we fail you, where we uh, don't look to you, Lord. And we pray this morning that if it be under thy uh, will, Lord, that you might save someone, Lord, that you might speak life to them this morning. And we'd be faithful to give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it all, for it is in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Now, uh, we're going to be uh, preaching this morning... Uh, on being holy and meeting God in a holy place. Now, when we begin to think of holy places, we think maybe like this church building or, or something like that, but what we find with holy places is simply this. It's where God meets with you. It, it is a, a place that He has set apart to meet with you. In other words, there were nothing really special about the Mount of or of Horeb except that God was there. And, and so uh, a lot of times we get that a little bit confused. Back in the first verse, now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law. Now, if you remember the story of Moses' life, he had killed a, an Egyptian soldier and he ran for his life and he married a heathen woman. Now, when it says a priest of Midian, that was not a godly man. The priest's office hadn't been opened yet for the Jews, so the only thing that we can come to is that, that his father-in-law was an idolater and that he worshipped something besides God, and he was the priest. Now, when I say that, when I say that uh, be careful with who you hook up with. Now, God uh, showed mercy and grace to Moses, uh, but he was married to a heathen woman. Apparently, her daddy was. And, you know, what always amazed me about the wives of Moses, and then when he married an Ethiopian woman later, and she was probably a saved woman in the sense that saved was in that day, and, and he was criticized for that too. And so we, uh, we find that Moses spiritually is in a bad shape. I personally don't think he was saved. I don't think this, I think this is his salvation account. I think he was religious before that, and he did a lot of good things, and he gave up the throne of Egypt, but all that did not make Moses saved. Yeah. In fact, when God called to him, he didn't even know who he was. That's pretty good evidence he's not saved, is it not? And, and, and so we find then that he's in a, in a spiritually bad situation and hooked up with idolaters, and, and that's where he's at. Then I want you to see, and he led 
uh, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert. Now, the best I understand with Moses, with his speech impediment, that he liked to be alone. Now, uh, God's going to change his life drastically and, and, and make him a leader out of somebody that was typically a follower. He was going to change his life dramatically. But I want you to see, he was introverted and he took this flock to the backside of the desert. You know what? It was not his intention to find God. God found him. And, and so he, he was really, if anything, he was running from God, and, and he got out there where he could be by himself and nobody would bother him. And he came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb, and the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And, the, and he looked, and behold, the bush was burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. Now, I've heard a lot of different ideas on this, and most of them, to me, do nothing but minimize the miracle that Moses was beholden. I've heard people say, well, the desert there and the horror is a very hot place, and bushes sometimes spontaneously combust, and they, and they burn off. Uh, no, 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 and that might be true, I don't know, but in this situation, God set his presence on the bush. Now, uh, you know, that, that amazes me that then out of this situation, he was in a holy place. And was it because he was on the backside of the desert? No. Was it because he was on the mountain of Horeb? No. The reason it was a holy place is because God showed up. Now, every one of us has been in a situation, and we've been in those dry services, in those empty services, and you want to look around at the clock, and you want to, you want, you want to get out of the situation, and we've all been there. Uh, and you know, the only thing I can say to that is God hasn't showed up. It's not holy ground. And so we find then that there's a miraculous thing got Moses' attention. You know, kind of like what Brother Junior was saying a little bit earlier, you know, this virus has got people's attention for now. And seeing something like this in miraculous detail would get somebody's attention. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight while the bush is not burned. And the Lord saw that he turned aside to see and God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. Now, I think we see just a small glimpse of Moses' character now. And all through his life, you would see this, even maybe he may not have been an eloquent speaker. He was brave, he, he was a man of courage. Because, see, if I saw, if I heard somebody going, Larry, Larry, out in the middle of the desert, you know what? It would scare me to death. And instead of running, instead of hiding, he says, here I am. Here I am. This, I, I'm ready for it. What do you want of me? And most people would not have done that. So it shows a, a piece of Moses' character that has courage in it, that, that is a little bit different. And he, meaning God, said, Draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. And, and so he says, Listen, you're in an unusual place. You're in a space that a lot of people don't get to get to. And it wasn't because he was on the backside of the desert. It wasn't because he was on the foot of Mount Horeb. It was because God was meeting with him. And he says, listen, take your shoes off. This is a sacred place. Uh, I'm meeting with you. You know, uh, you know what I can come to this? And I, I don't know. I don't do much without my shoes on. But it was an indication of, hope, uh, of reverencing God's holiness. You know, we don't do a whole lot of that anymore, do we? And I think uh, a lot of the reason we don't experience God's holiest holiness more than we do is because we don't appreciate it like we should. 
Verse 6 says, Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. So I want you to see it in verse 6, we see God introducing himself to Moses. And that's why I say he was never saved before that because he met God on the Mount of Horeb and he met him there in a holy place. Now, I ask you this morning, how many times have you been in a holy place? How many times have you been in a situation where you met with God? How many times have you been like Moses was on this occasion? And uh, I dare say most of us would have to say few and far between. Uh, if we'd be honest. Now, we can say, oh, uh, you know, I heard, a, uh, I, I heard a preacher say, well, God meets with us every Sunday. And, and I wanted to say, I doubt that. I've been to the church many times, and I, I, I doubt it seriously. Just because you present the Word of God doesn't mean God meets with you. I wish it was that way. But time and time again in Moses, I mean, even in the life of David, he was saying, Oh God, where art thou? Why hast thou left me? And see, when we see that, we, mean, we know that just because God's people meet doesn't make it a holy time. Yeah. And, and so we as the Lord's people, what we ought to desire more than anything else is simply that God would meet with us as a people together and that he would, uh, and he would, put, uh, he would put himself among us. Go with me to Exodus 33. Exodus 33. In the very first verse, Exodus 33, in the first verse, the Bible says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Depart, go up hence, thou and the people which thou hast brought up out of the land of Egypt, and the land which I swear unto the land which I swear unto Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, saying, Unto my seed will I give it. And I will send an angel before thee, and I will drive out the Canaanite, and the Amorite, and the Hittite, and the Perizzite, and the Hivite, and the Jebusite, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, milk and honey, for I will not go up in the midst of thee, for thou art a stiff-necked people, lest I consume thee in the way. Now I want you to see in verse 3, uh, we get an idea of the nature of the people of Israel. He says, you're stiff in that. You will not follow me. See, uh, uh, it, what the important thing is in, in the modern day, in the church age, is that we follow the Word of God. The Bible says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So this is it. And the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, when them two mingle together, you follow it, and you follow it with everything you have. And here, God describes the people of Israel as stiff-necked. They would not follow the guy. And when the people heard these evil tidings about their self, they mourned. Now, in the modern day, listen, if you don't preach a health and wealth sermon, everything, and go around in a big group hug, Listen, people get mad at you. They want to hear something else. But I want you to see that God's word for the people of Israel was not warm fuzzies. He says, you're a bunch of stiff-necked people. But now this is the good thing. They mourned. Now, uh, that is where we need to be. Even when the message is bad and it's not a warm fuzzy, uh, God shows up. That's holy. That, 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 that's reverent. That, that, that is something that to the inner man at least ought to be enticing and, and draw us to him. And we see that these people were very upset about it. And no man did put on his ornaments. And the Lord said unto the Moses, say unto the children of Israel, you are a stiff-necked people. I will come up unto the uh, midst of thee in a moment, and I will consume thee. Therefore, now put off the ornaments with thee, that I may know what 
uh, what to do unto you. And the children of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments by Mount Hora. Now, I want you to see where they are again and what they're doing. And the uh, same place where God met with Moses, and it has an impact in their life. Now, I don't know if these ornaments were in, sewn into their garments or if they were jewelry or what, what the ornaments were, and, but my guess is that they had an Egyptian nature, that they were something that identified them still back to Egypt where the riches were. And you know, when they, the night before they left, the women went in and said, can I have this and can I have that? And it was, it was for the building of the temple. Remember that? Jewels and gold and, and, and all the beautiful things that later would uh, ordain the temple, and it makes you wonder, well, maybe they kept a little bit of it. And they had all this array of jewelry or ornaments, and they came to a place they had to take it off. And the place they took it off was holy. You know, when you give up something that you love better than anything for the Almighty, it's a holy place. Mm -hmm. It's a place that you will treasure. It's a place that you'll enjoy and that you'll, that you'll thrive in. And so we see that a holy place, when we approach a holy place, when we approach a place that God might meet with us, it impacts our life. See, they mourned over the news from God. They mourned that they were called a stiff-necked people. They mourned, and, and, and you know what? Uh, whatever that stuff was, it was a manifestation of their stiff neck. I want to be like Egypt. And, and God uh, and God did a great thing, and they they threw them down, and they moved on in the middle of God's will, and it became a wonderful holy place. You can't go to a holy place and leave and not be impacted, and that's everybody. Uh, when people says, oh, I, I, I've been saved. I've been to a holy place. And they look and act like they always did. I have no confidence whatsoever. None whatsoever. Because, see, it impacted these people. It changed them in an unusual way. Now, go with me to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 9. Luke, chapter 9. And we're going to begin reading verse 28. Luke chapter 9 and verse 28. The Bible says, And it came to pass about eight days after these things, he took Peter and John and James and went up unto a mountain to pray. Now, I want you to notice a couple of things here. And as you know, the, the inner circle was the one that was included but I want you to see what he didn't say. He did not say, Peter, James, and John, come with me because you're going to see me as God. When we get up on top of that mountain, you're going to see me like you've never seen me before. He said, I need to go pray. You three come with me. I mean, he said he went up over the mountain apart to pray, and you know what? They probably did this many, many, many times, and you know, you wonder if they thought, oh, here we go again. Got to climb up this mountain. Got to get all the way to the top, and got to stand watch guard while he prays a little bit. You know what? I bet it got kind of a tiring chore, don't you? But see, when God asks you to do the ordinary, you don't know when it'll be holy ground when you get up there. We always thank the Lord up here we go again. Sunday morning, Sunday school, preaching, meal, Adam's class, blah, 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 blah. But you don't know what it's going to be, you see. Right. He's asked you to come. He's asked you to do it. So it may just be that it's holy ground. Mm -hmm. and, and so we find that there's no qualms and there's no old me's documented. And, and, and they get up and they go with the Lord. And as he, meaning Christ, prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered, and his raiment was white and glistening. And behold, there talked with him two men, which were Moses and Elisha, or Elias. Now, I want you to see what an what a unbelievable thing that would be. And it says the Lord was praying. It did not say that Peter, James, and John was praying. They said, and as he, meaning Christ, 
He was praying. So maybe they were just watching. Maybe they weren't in a condition of prayer and they weren't before the Lord in that way. And they were just kind of watching to see what was going on. And as they were watching that thing, he became white, looked white as the snow, and out of nowhere became a person. The persons of Elisha and Moses saying, listen, Jesus, we know you're going through a tough time. We know the day is coming, but you just hang in there. It, 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 it's going to be good. And whoo, what a mad, what an unbelievable thing. See, you just don't know what you're going to get. But an ordinary place that they climbed many, many times <laughs> had become holy ground. See, the difference is not the, the plot of ground. The difference is the presence of the Almighty. And, and they got to see unusual, wonderful things. But Peter and they that were with him were heavy with sleep. And when they were awake, they saw his glory. And the two men with him. And the two men that stood with him. And it came to pass as they departed from them, meaning that Elisha and uh, Elijah and Moses was leaving, Peter said unto him, Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here, and let us make thee three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias, not knowing what he said. Now, uh, the reason this was a problem. Number one is Moses was just a man. And Elisha was just a man. And, and Peter got his mouth running. So I believe the next thing with this situation, you just enjoy it. You don't have to act a fool. You don't have you, you don't you don't have to say one thing if you don't, if you're not led to. Just enjoy holy ground. When you get there and you're abiding there, just enjoy it. Uh, and, and you know what? What I found eventually, the Almighty would leave and then it's time to be finished up. So we find that Peter gets his mouth running as usual. Uh, verse 34. And while he thus spake, in, in other words, while Peter was saying these words, there came a clot. <clears throat> excuse me, there came a while he thus spake, there came a cloud and overshadowed them, and they feared as they entered into the cloud. Now, can you imagine they're sitting up there, and Peter's blabbering his stuff, and there comes this big dark cloud coming down over them. And it says as they entered the cloud. You ever entered a cloud? I haven't. I got close with a couple of tornadoes, but I've never been in one yet. You know what? That'd make me afraid, wouldn't you? to be inside a cloud. You know what was inside the cloud for these three gentlemen? It was holy ground. Yeah. So we find then there may be some risk. You know, we, uh, we thrive here in the United States on freedom of religion for now. But there may be some risk on down the road. Uh, you may get into a cloud. You, you may get in a situation where things is not quite as clear as, as they once were, and yet and still at the very same time, it was a holy place for these men to be, and they understood that. And there came a voice of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son, hear ye him. Now, another instance, is, instance where this happened was the baptism uh, that Jesus had at the hands of John the Baptist and the Lord came down and says in the presence of a dove and says this is my beloved son, hear ye him, or no uh, I am well pleased and he came down in that way see, in addition to climbing the mountain, in addition to the cloudy and uh, they got to meet with God see, you don't find too much that among people anymore, do you? Uh, people that that that, is in, uh, that that have such an experience, they know when they've left that place that surely, surely they had been with God, and these these men experienced it firsthand. Verse thirty six, and when the voice was passed, Jesus was found alone, and they kept it close and told no man. 
in those days any of those things which they had seen. Now, unusual thing here, and maybe it shows that, and I think it does, that, per, that holy ground is personal. It, it, it's a private thing between you and the Almighty. It, it, it's not to be the teacher horn and to say, you know what? God met with me this morning. You know, thrilled in it, thrive in it, enjoy it. But listen, keep it a private relationship. Keep it, keep it between you and the Lord. And, and so we find then that uh, they had a uh, they had an experience and they enjoyed a wonderful experience and they kept it privately just between themselves. Now go with me to Acts chapter 2. We read of a similar experience where God uh, chose to meet with his people. Acts chapter 2 in the very first verse. Acts chapter 2 in the first day, verse, the Bible says that when the day of Pentecost, now the day of Pentecost was uh, 50 days after the Passover, it was very, a very wonderful celebration that they would have kind of subsequent after. Now, if I understand when the uh, Passover was uh, and the resurrection of our Lord, uh, it would be uh, right about now. I believe the Lord was offered uh, on a Wednesday, and then he was, that would have been April, very close to our April uh, 12th. And, and then he uh, he was resurrected or April the 14th and then he was resurrected just a few days later and so this must have been down in late June mid June and they were having they were having a special celebration uh, and it also means that it was about 10 days after the Lord went up because if he was resurrected the Sunday after the Passover and he was with them 40 days and 40 nights and this is the day of Pentecost it was only 10 days after he left, right? And, and, and so, you know, that's not a long time to wait. And he said, you stay here until you're endued, until you're filled, until you're, uh, it's, uh, it's put within you the power from on high. You wait to that moment, and then you can go into all the world. And you know what? Uh, I wonder if some of them got impatient in those 10 days. I bet you they did. Uh, not long to wait, but you know what? We get we get really uh, kind of frustrated with the Lord sometimes, and we get tired of waiting. But listen, just wait on the Lord. And so uh, that's where we're at in the timeline. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind. You know what I think that was? I think it was a sound just like the, the top of the building was fixing to rip off. I believe it was literally a rushing mighty wind, something that they'd never heard before, something very, very unusual. And listen, it got our attention. You know what? It's a shame and disgrace that physical things get our attention more than spiritual. Yeah. But see, that physical event, see, it woke them up a little bit. You know, you know what our churches need today? Then he woke up. Then he woke up. And, and, and so we find then that they have this unusual experience and this wind comes across the place. And it, meaning the wind, filled all the house where they were sitting. So I'm assuming it passed over come right in where they were at and it was whirling around the room. You know what? That would get people's attention today, wouldn't it? Uh, that, that would make people wake up and say, oh, listen, that would get people better than the corona would, wouldn't it? Just to see things spinning around the room, you know, we got some pen books and a, a jacket or two in here and just see them flying around. Listen, that would get somebody's attention, wouldn't it? And the best we know, you know where they were at? They're still in the upper room, right? A very, very ordinary place that's fixing to become holy ground. See, uh, 
When, when you come here, do you anticipate God to show up? Or do you anticipate another boy to show up? See, I, I believe that makes all the difference, don't you? I really do. Uh, how we prep for the service and, and prepare for the day, I think that's, a, I think that's essential if we're going to experience the Lord like we wish. All right, so the, the wind is spinning around in the room in verse 3, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. Now, clothing, meaning they had clothes on, so it was these bright objects, these bright, uh, I'm assuming somewhat looking like a, a person, and he came around, and, and it sat on them, literally. It came around, and listen, listen, they got power they have haven't, they had never had before. The Holy Ghost had showed up. You, you know why our churches are meager today? No Holy Ghost. <clears throat> when the house of the Lord in the Old Testament, when God left, what happened? They wrote Ichabod across the door. Meaning, joy departed. How many people do you see when you go to other churches that are joyful? That are glad to be there, that are enjoying every minute of the time? And I'd say very, very little, if you'd be honest. Very, very little. See, I, I, I want to be excited about the things of God, don't you? I, I want to be, I, I want to be craving that He would just meet with us, even if it's just only one minute out of the whole hour, that God would come down and He would meet with us in an unusual way. That's what I desire most of all. And so these these tongues, these fire flames, whatever they were, that had clothes on them, were running around and setting on people, and it changed them unbelievably. And there, and verse 4, and they were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven, and that was because the Passover, I mean because the day of Pentecost, they were observing the day of Pentecost. And when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard, heard them speak in his own language. Now, I want you to see the, the amazing part of this wasn't gibber jabber. It was what they heard. Now, all those men, the best we know, they were Galilean Hebrew. And so they probably spoke of Tennessee Hebrew. Slang, not quite right with what the Jews would say. Oh, man, they correct the grammar a little bit, you know. And instead of hearing in that hick tongue, they, if whatever they're, and it wasn't just Jewish Hebrew. If they were Midianite, they were hearing in the Midian tongue. If they were Greek, they were hearing in their Greek tongue. Whatever their birth language was, that's what they were hearing. Listen, you know what that is? That's holy ground. That, that, that's unbelievable things. And, and you know, we all say, well, that can't happen again. Where do you get that? Where, where do you find that in the Word of God? I don't think you will. You know, and, and, and listen, I don't know. Uh, Again, the older I get, the more that I'm not going to doubt God, the more I'm going to have confidence in God. But I heard a man tell me one time, uh, maybe Brother Kraft told me about it, that a man went into a service here in the States, didn't speak a word of English whatsoever. The man spoke in English, and he heard a fluent Spanish. Is God still God? Yeah. You, you know, I bet it took that little Hispanic man a lot of courage to go into a building when he knew he wouldn't understand anything. See, have you ever wondered why, why we don't see things like that? It's because we don't have faith to do so. See, he wanted to hear from God, and that was his only option. So he took it. And, and so we find then this place, this upper room, the meeting house that they were in, where where the Lord had met with them for 40 days, now had become holy ground. 
And why did it become holy ground? Because the Holy Spirit showed up, the Holy Ghost met with them, and made it a wonderful place to abide. Now, I want to go to Acts chapter 9, and we're going to close. Acts chapter 9, in the very first verse, uh, very familiar verses of Scripture, the salvation of Paul, of Saul, who would become Paul. Uh, Acts chapter 9, in the first verse, and Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughters against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest, and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he will found any of this way, meaning in a Christian way, whether they were men or women, that he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined around about him a light from heaven. Now, listen, in, in holy ground, there's always light. Remember, as the works of creation began, uh, it says, in the beginning, there was light. Yeah. See, and this is what I believe, that this place we now call Earth, I believe back in eternity past somewhere, Lucifer and his bunch, Satan, whatever you want to call him, had done rebelled. And they were cast here. And where sin is, there's darkness. The Bible is very clear about that. Where sin is at is darkness. And God displayed himself, said, okay, we're going to separate the light from the darkness. See, that, that's the first indication of biblical separation, isn't it? He separated the light from the darkness. There's two different things out there. And after, after he separated that out and the light became meaningful, the light became what it was, uh, it's a symbol. So Paul's on his uh, way down to Damascus to break up the little church down there and, and see what harm that he could cause. And suddenly there's light. See, uh, you know, I've heard Armenian people say, well, God, Paul was out seeking God, but it sounded like he wanted to take care of the problem to me. Didn't he, you? He, he wasn't interested in God. Not one little bit. But see, God opened his heart and his eyes. See, that light pounced on him. And that little place on the road to Damascus became holy ground. Amen. See, uh, we need holy ground right here, don't we? Amen. Listen, we're, we're, we're in the day where the devil would have us to be so <coughs> uh, I believe Corona's getting uh, a hold of some people's attention, but on the very same token, on the flip side, uh, God's not giving us a spirit of fear, but of love and a sound mind. And you know what? I'm not going to fear this thing. And, and, and so we find then as the Lord's people that uh, this amazing light shows up and, uh, and, and Paul's attention is totally changed. And, and they design, uh, verse 4, it says, And he fell to the earth and heard a voice from heaven saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Now, I want you to notice two things. The reason I know that this is a very, very, very similar experience that Moses had on the backside of the desert is that God spoke to Moses and Jesus spoke to Paul. See, they, they had to introduce him. I am Jesus. I'm him. See, uh, when you meet with God, it becomes a holy place, does it not? When you meet with God, it is an unusual thing. Not just going through the routine, but when God really comes down and he engages you and, 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 and you with him and, and you enjoy that sweet time of fellowship, that is what we ought to thrive on at all times. And he trembling and astonished and said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and I shall be, and it shall be told thou what thou must do. Not, not, uh, not have do. What you going to do? 
which you absolutely must do. And the men that journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man, but they led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus. Now, you know your Bible, and there's three days and three nights that Paul's blind. And uh, the good thing about being blind is this. There are no distractions. There are no distractions because all you have is right there. Man. You know, uh, Fanny Crosby, the famous hymn writer, we, we sung one of our hymns today uh, about uh, safe in the arms of Jesus. Blind from six weeks old to the day she died. And she was often asked, what would you like to look upon if you could see? She goes, no, no, I don't want to see. The first thing I want to behold is the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> see, uh, that's where we need to be. We need to be on holy ground. We, we need to be in a place where God is meeting with us as a church and where he's meeting with you individually, where he's meeting with you in your homes, where, where, where God is, is the center of your life. And you'll mark that for the rest of your life. And e even if it's a little physical, you know, I will always remember the day the Lord saved me. And I go in that little free will church at Carlisle and I can show you the exact spot where the Lord made me new and never been the same again. Yeah. So that's holy ground for me. I can show you where, if you call it surrender to preach, it was on the front porch of my in-law's house. I know they thought I'd gone crazy. Came up there crying and bubbling. But God had done a great work in my life. That's holy ground. Uh, uh, that's what we need in our lives. And when we find holy ground, rush to it. Thrive on it. Don't be scared. Enjoy it. That's what we need.